I have a brother who's incarcerated. I have a sister who I lost to a drug overdose. I never knew my biological father. On the first day of the riots, their car was stolen at gunpoint. We landed in a little studio apartment off Mission Street, and my sisters and I slept in the closet. But now I'm the supervisor. I am Carmen Chu, and I'm the city administrator of San Francisco. My name is London Breed, and I'm the mayor of San Francisco. My name is Malia Cohen. I am the California State Controller. My message to a young woman of color is that you have incredible assets and experiences that we need in politics today. You are smart. You are gifted. You can do whatever you want to do. You have a purpose. And to find that purpose, you have to fight for it. It's not going to just be handed to you. So take the power, right? Take the power. Because why not? <laughs> Why not? This is going to be edited, right? Welcome, LA Progressive friends and family and readers. Today, I'm going to be talking to Amy Allison. Amy is a writer, a democratic innovator, and a visionary champion of racial and gender justice. She is the founder and president of She the People, the nation's leading organization dedicated to an America redefined and inspired by women of color. Hi there, Amy. Hey, Sharon, I'm so happy to see you. Same here. So I'm just really excited about what has been going on with She the People. I think, you know, when you and I met, oh, I don't know, I, I think it's more, it definitely is more than 10 years because I was on the Progressive Caucus um, Executive Board of the Democratic Party and you were a keynote speaker for a thing that we did. Oh, but but that was definitely more than 10 years ago. That's right, that's right. It's been, it's been <sighs> a journey for both of us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but here it's, in California, we're Californians. That's right. We're California. Yeah. So so talk to me about She the People. It's just so exciting to just have this um this body of work that you you're doing and 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 the support that you're providing to women, but I'm going to shut up and you talk to me about how it started and what you guys are doing. Thank you for the opportunity because uh when we say it's been a journey, it's also been a journey for women of color in politics here in California and, and across the country. Uh, when I started She the People, the term women of color was not used as it related to American politics, Democratic Party politics, or politics anywhere, the way that politics was understood, the way it was reported. And over the last five years, She the People as an organ organization especially focused on creating a new narrative to help expand the imagination of what could happen, where we could go as Americans, and who would be leading the change. You talk about progressive politics, uh, who's leading organizers on the ground, who holds the moral and democratic faith that, that stood in the fly, you know, was flying in the face of what, you know, Trump, who of course is arraigned today, and um, the Republicans are, are, were doing, but it wasn't just about Republicans. It was about the racism and sexism that uh, has poisoned our political system from day one. And this is a group of people uh, that are hold that democratic faith or talk about black women show up to the polls uh, more than any other race and gender who, when we lead, uh, are more likely to stand for issues of racial, economic, and gender justice, who bring this valuable uh, and underrepresented lived experience. And so She the People, we have done uh, and played a very important role in focusing the American story on 
women of color, black women, Latina women, uh, Asian America, Pacific Islander, Native women. And also the, the ways that we are connected and more similar than different. And we've seen over the last five years that our work made a difference. We have shifted American culture in the way that because we're in it, it's kind of like we're all fish and the culture is water. And so we don't perceive the way that uh, often the culture at large uh, shapes our understanding or our expectation of what's normal, you know, or what's, uh, or, or who should, what a leader should look like or sound like or dress like, uh, their hair, their, their skin, their, the way that they present themselves. Uh, who should be a governor or who should be a senator? All of those things, the culture, before we're voting citizens, the culture defines those things. And so uh, we've been working on that. Uh, and that really looks like in practica practical terms, helping reporters and editors and media influencers understand the data and understand who we are. So that's the work of She the People. Uh, we, we are facing some, you know, we, we basically have seen historic wins. We've seen, uh, you, you remember 2018, I declared was the year of women of color in politics because we had Rashida Tlaib and AOC and Veronica, Veronica Escobar and a whole cadre, Ilhan Omar, a cadre of women of color who um, call themselves a squad and they came in to, to, to both be in solidarity and to show leadership, which they had. They joined people like Congresswoman Barbara Lee, who after a lot of us uh, sounded the alarm, we didn't have a black woman in Democratic Party leadership. She joined Nancy Pelosi and others. And she, as the most senior woman of color, worked with the squad and they got in high profile uh, committee appointments and they led from there. And then we had more join in 2020 and even more in 2022. But at the same time, Republicans who had, uh, through uh, contesting the election, through voter suppression at the state level, through really uh, fighting culture wars that focused on particularly uh, Black and brown people and Black and brown women about our personhood our value, whether our, our story and our place in history even deserved anything, you know, we deserved anything, you know, they're, they're fighting that war. And that is the part of the, the uh, backlash that we're experiencing now. So right, that's the right. story of she, the people, and we're in it. I mean, today I was in an Instagram live with an amazing leader from Tennessee, a woman named Marquita Bradshaw. I just want to say for those of us who live in California, we have to watch what's happening in places like Tennessee. Because we see right now, remember, there was a terrible school shooting, right? And, a, and you know, as this happens for, in American cities and malls and um, uh, churches and movie theaters, another group of people were murdered by a gunman, a, a person who uh, killed three children and three adults. The, the state legislature is dominated by Republicans in Tennessee. And thousands and thousands of a lot of young people, organizers, others converged on the state capitol. And what did the GOP led you know, leadership in the state do? Instead of responding to the cry to address gun violence, they ha are now uh, about to tomorrow <laughs> consider um, expelling three elected members of the state legislature two of them are the youngest and they're both black and they both stood with their own constituents calling for gun control. And this anti-democratic move is, it's nice to say it's an overreach, but it is uh, a tactic that is deeply, deeply uh, antithetical to everyone who believes in democracy and black people's self-determination. And for those who are calling for our kids to be safe in schools, all those things. Marquita Bradshaw is a leader. She, she's a, she leads her organization um, uh, doing environmental justice. But she also ran for U.S. Senate. So this is the thing I want to say 
about the intersection between our organizing and women of color in politics. Marquita Bradshaw didn't have any money. She didn't have uh, big time uh, elected officials endorsing her. And she ran in 2019 to be the uh, Democratic nominee for U.S. Senate in the state of Tennessee, a state that if you ask national uh, Democratic so-called experts, they would write off Tennessee and say that's a red state. But Marquita Bradshaw, uh, she, uh, she ran and won that primary against the sort of golden boy white guy that the uh, established Democratic Party had put their money behind, who had $20 million, and she beat him statewide. And after she became the Democratic nominee, she got no support from the National Democratic Party. So what do, why am I saying this? I'm saying what's happening right now, if you turn on MSNBC or you open up your paper, LA Times or wherever, whatever you're reading, and you see what's happening in Tennessee, we have to understand who are the people who are going to deliver, not only the people from Tennessee, but all of us, who are the people who have who have um, who are standing for us with us both as an organizer and that are ready to lead and govern in a new way and Marquita Bradshaw is one of those people and she's a friend of she the people's just because someone runs and ultimately loses doesn't mean that person should be forgotten about and this is what we're this is the the next frontier we have to continue supporting high potential leadership in places like Tennessee, because we, I personally believe that we have to build a national network that uplifts and supports them. So that's looking forward to the kind of work that she, the people uh, is committed to doing. Absolutely. That's, that's a, that, that's a great lead in for, um, for those who would might um, complain that she, the people is nothing more than identity politics. What I want to ask you is, what is the material difference between having leadership looking like the people that they're leading and leadership that doesn't? Um, and and, I, and I'll, I, I have my own sense, <laughs> but I'll let you answer that. First of all, remember the attack on identity politics comes from the right wing. Now, I grew up, you know, I'm in my 50s. So like generally, gener I'm Generation X, right? So I cut my political teeth on a movement calling for multicultural education. And the, the, the foundational belief and value behind that was, is that the identity of writers, like the, that the people who are in the academic canon that help prepare this next generation of people should be as diverse as the population themselves, and that there is value in um, including and um, the experiences of women and men of color, indigenous people, immigrants, and that that diversity strengthens our capacity to be able to, to understand the country and the world and to lead going forward. But those culture wars are still being fought today. And so people who say, well, it's just identity politics are giving us a right wing talking point. I was at, uh, it's funny because I was thinking about my time as an undergraduate. I was thinking about the fact that Bennett, who was uh, Ronald Reagan's secretary of education, came to campus to essentially debunk what we students were organizing for. And to say that Western culture, white men culture, uh, was the thing that that was worth defending. And it's the only thing that uh, uh, this kind of Western culture, this is the thing that he uh, came from Washington, D.C. to our campus to, to defend. And to, uh, because he understood that, you know, I think they understood the power of identity fueling a certain kind of political power. So what I say to people who dismiss uh, race or gender as just identity politics to, are, are, are really undercutting the thing that we've got going for us. Absolutely. I mean, here's, what, here's the thing we got going for us. Let, let's talk about Californians because uh, there's no majority anyone. I mean, there's uh, a sizable population, 
of, of Latin A people, Latino, Latina, and we know that. But there are more black people in California than in Mississippi. Uh, the Asian American Pacific Islander population and the pockets of that is significant, so much so that in places like in Riverside or in LA or in other places, that it doesn't feel like this is like a, a, a dismissed minority of people. And that also, when we're together, united by a set of values and politics, we're incredibly powerful. We can win seats, we can push our uh, political agenda, and we can um, have a policy and a government that serves us, which is really the goal. So I, first and foremost, I say that. The second is that She the People did, we worked with uh, USC uh, researchers out of the School of Social Work, and we went to 10 states uh, last year in these listening sessions of women of color, like multiracial circles of women of color. We went to the Central Valley and in LA here in California. We also went to Nevada, went to Ohio, uh, Texas, Florida, um, and, and so on, New York, and so on. We got a really good sense of how women of color are feeling about uh, both politics and their lives. And that's motivating women of color in our politics and our point of view. Um, it is actually what people stand for. And so from the very big, from the very founding of She the People, I never wanted people to think that this was just a like an exercise in sort of um, you know, someone who identifies as a woman and someone who's non-white. It has to be the values. And that's why we always present women of color who express and want to govern based on love and justice and belonging and democracy. And those are the foundational values that are underneath any policy platform, any campaign, or any kind of movement. And we have to be about the values because the problems that we face in this country are really, really big, and they're far bigger than politics. So I would just say that Right now, we have this opportunity to show the rest of the country what it looks like to be in true solidarity with people of all walks of life who come from different backgrounds. And solidarity is uh, the thing that will defeat or interrupt white supremacy. Because white supremacy, the, the evil genius of white supremacy, is that it can include people who are non-white in the uh, defense and implementation of, of systems, of structures uh, of white supremacy that keep white people uh, benefiting from the structure and the rest of us out. So that can include people of color. So we have to, uh, and, and what we heard from women all over the country is we want people who govern with those values, that it isn't just a black woman getting elected. If that was the case, we would be celebrating for the Lieutenant Governor of Virginia, but we aren't because this person is a Trump supporter and the person who advances the cause of white supremacy in a bunch of different ways. So it isn't just race and gender, but it's who we are in aggregate expressed in those values that I think is so incredibly important. And that's the thing we wanna build power around. Absolutely. You know. What you're talking about for many people is, a, is a, it's a complex concept. The fact that we live in a country that was built on the basis of white supremacy. And because we're all from this country, we all swim in the same water. People who are not white can and have and do internalize white supremacist ideology. And it's why it's so important that organizations like yours change the narrative and help to educate people about what system, systematic systems of oppression, what they are and how they can continue to operate even when we have black and brown faces in high places. So I'm so excited about the work that you're doing and um, I was looking at, at your site and you have a series there on, let, and let's remind people what the URL is. It's shethepeople.org. So you have a series of stories. I'm gonna scroll up. Um, 
about she the people and i don't want i don't want to uh, ask you about something that oh i see our candidates so you endorse candidates and i'm just so excited about that i see these women i see karen uh, bass who is now my mayor i live in los angeles Karen Bass shows up and um, obviously Val Demings, who we all know, and Stacey Abrams, people that we know and love. And I love the idea that you said, even if you don't win the election, that doesn't mean that we just forget about you. Absolutely uh, not. We have, you know, uh, we have to be as committed to a pipeline of leadership. We have to be as committed to looking for leadership. I mean, this next generation that the kinds of women of color who are organizing right now in Tennessee, for example, uh, in Florida, for example, or Texas or other places, even, you know, in, in LA, um, we have to have a place for people to go, a political home um, that really sees the, the value and importance of providing long-term support uh, for people. It isn't just a like go run for office, like, oh, just just run for, like running for office requires, uh, as Stacey Abrams would have said, like a, you know, a deep plan for how you're gonna pay your own bills and how you're gonna fundraise to run a campaign. Those are two separate things. How you're going to tell your story and how you're gonna be authentic to your own people. Um, how you're going to bring movement with you and how are you gonna stay connected and accountable to the movements that work on your behalf and looking at the ways in which power operates in an ecosystem requires us to be communicating with really young women about the possibilities in a relationship over time. So when I called like a Marquita Bradshaw, uh, you know, when, when, when uh, she didn't get national support for her bid for Senate, and remember there are no black women in the Senate for a reason. I have had my heart broken, I think for, for a long time, many cycles. Uh, I remember in 2014, we had uh, Donna, Donna Edwards, who was a Congresswoman from Maryland. She was running in a democratic primary. Maryland is the third blackest state. There are the voters in that state. And if you looked at who's in the state and who's striving democratic and statewide wins, Black women are the key there. And yet uh, the, the party, uh, uh, the, the, the head at the, at the time, we had the, um, you know, the majority leader who's now deceased, but that, that they behind the scenes through their support uh, for the, the white guy. And we've seen it time and time again. What happens to both established leaders and our upcoming leaders is that we have to build power by making sure that we have our own um, sources of money, support, media, uplift. I mean, the LA Progressive is one of those uh, sources, but there, you know, and there are many, many others that we have to develop. And we have to keep those relationships because leadership can take many forms. I mean, I, I ran for office, what's that, two, 2006. I ran for office this, you know, and did not get the, get, uh, get the seat. But instead of like abandoning the thought that that my leadership has no place, a lot of that experience was transformed into the work that I do now. So I can talk to people who have both have experience running campaigns or considering running and who have already run, they, they've run and lost or they're in office now and they wanna do something else. And I have played a role in, in, in helping people to make those decisions and providing support. So I just, I think that's going to be important going forward for us to build this movement that we've started. Absolutely. So um, before we, before we end, can you tell the readers what they can do to support Chi the people? The most, I, you know, I, uh, one thing is that to, to stay in touch on social uh, with us on Instagram and on Facebook so that, you know, that for example, she, the people is, uh, lending support to Barbara Lee, who's running for Senate in California. Uh, that, that to me, you know, helps she the people help Barbara Lee. Because uh, it's interesting in California, 
where you had a, a narrative that the two uh, more junior uh, Congress people who weren't, you know, who didn't have a racial justice analysis, uh, that they were the they were the leaders of this race, and that Barbara Lee was being discounted by very, you know, very early on. Bar Barbara Lee, though, represents a California that elected Bernie Sanders. Barbara Lee stands for she has she has built a multiracial coalition and has stayed connected to movement for more than 22 years. So I think part of what we need to do as, uh, as a movement and as an organization is to figure out how to elevate and put into positions of power and governance. Like we need to be running things, not just, we don't wanna to run to lose. We wanna be, um, we wanna be in governance and uh, so that Senate uh, primary, I think, is a great way to get involved in this moment. Wonderful. Well, Amy Allison, it was such a pleasure having you here. Um, LA Progressive stands with you, particularly in your support of Barbara Lee. Um, I hope to chat with you again in the future, but we're encouraging all LA Progressive readers to go to She the People to follow you on social. And we'll be putting some links at the bottom of this um, video recording. So thank you, Amy. Thank you, Sharon. You're my ride or die. You're a ride <laughs> or die. Thanks for everything you do. Oh, thank you so much. So long.